Hey, you all, Carpetbagger here coming to you live from the north. More specifically, we are in Dayton, Ohio. And even more specifically than that, we are at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Now, a few weeks ago, I was in this area in the Cincinnati, Dayton area, and uh, I put out a poll on my channel on which place you guys wanted me to visit. I, I couldn't make up my mind if I wanted to go to the Cincinnati Zoo or if I wanted to go to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. And the vote was pretty close, but you guys voted to send me to the zoo. And now, as my travels, my multi-week trip across the country has come back full circle, I found myself once again in the greater Cincinnati area. And uh, I figured, might as well, might as well visit the runner-up and check out the National Museum of the United States Air Force. I've gotten a lot of recommendations over the years to check uh, out this museum, so I figure it's time to check out the Air Force Museum. So please, follow me. So this appears to be a very well visited museum. Yeah, the parking lot is full of cars and uh, this building itself is absolutely massive. I'm guessing they're having to keep planes, airplanes and other craft inside. It takes a lot of room. And I'm guessing that the entrance is that way. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. All right, got my map here, and oh boy, there's a lot of airplanes in this. You got, looks like, uh, it's like these three massive buildings, four massive buildings, and they're just absolutely filled to the brim with planes. And apparently they actually have a special dinosaur exhibit in addition to all this. Okay, and heading in to the uh, first room here, the first hangar. I guess just taking a second to take everything in. So like many stories, this story begins at the beginning. And here is the 1909 military flyer. This was a plane developed by the Wright brothers and uh, the first plane purchased by the United States military. So this was in 1909, the Wright brothers tested their plane in 1903. So this is literally only six years after the airplane was invented and the military was already, uh, already testing out its uses. Now this is Lieutenant Benjamin Folius, and I guess he's has his flag there so he can signal to the uh, to the pilot of the plane. I don't know. This is, I think that takes certain bravery. This 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 flying machine only invented a matter of years prior to this, and you're uh, you're you're willing to take it and uh, do things with it that have never ever even been attempted. People have only been flying for a few years and uh, and you're diving in head first. And this is, this is pretty amazing, a 1903 Wright Flyer fabric. So this actually is genuine. This is a piece of cloth used in the uh, 1903 um, Wright Flyer. So the literal uh, first airplane ever flown, that is a piece of it. Now these super old planes are reproductions because you can see here it's made out of bamboo. They just simply did not last. But yeah, basically a flying bicycle. This is the uh, second plane ever purchased by the uh, US military. Some interesting photos here. These are actually photos of the first ever plane crash only occurred in 1908. It says Orville Wright was aboard and seriously injured and Thomas Selfridge was uh, fatally injured, became the first person to die in an airplane accident. So yeah, not very, not very long after those invented, they had the, the first, uh, first tragedy. Got some of the very early military uh, aircrafts here hanging in the hangar.
And some of these cases focus on particular servicemen. This is the flight gear of Lieutenant Fred Norton. His jacket, his boots there, his cool hats, and uh, some of the flight goggles. Now this is a fascinating story. It's Lieutenant Quentin Roosevelt, the son of Teddy Roosevelt. Apparently he was a pilot and actually during uh, during World War I, he would crash his plane behind enemy lines, behind German lines. But I guess the Germans, out of respect, buried him. He said he crashed very near the, near the front lines. So the Germans buried him and then they fashioned a cross out of sticks and wires. The wires were actually taken from his aircraft and this was placed on his grave. This is the actual cross that was placed on the grave of Quentin Roosevelt, the makeshift grave. That's so very, very fascinating. And uh, this just caught my eye. This is, says acquired from the Milwaukee Public Museum. That is the museum I grew up going to in Milwaukee. So amazing artifact. This is Lieutenant Stephen Thompson and uh, his uniform and gear here. But the thing that strikes me the most is this, this little figure here. It's like a little man with a big burly mustache and no arms. This is his, this is his, uh, his mascot. It's he carried him with him at all times. His name was Old Bill. Oh man, I love Old Bill. They should sell Old Bills in the gift shop here. I think he's a great mascot. So this here is a wind tunnel. And I've heard the term wind tunnel used many times. I never really knew what a wind tunnel was. Apparently a wind tunnel, it is a, uh, it creates, you know, wind, obviously. But the purpose is that they would use this to test aircraft. They would build model aircraft and put them in here. The window allow them to observe the miniature aircraft while the tunnel creates winds so they can try out new designs. I learned something today. Here is a homing pigeon. Uh, apparently the pigeons used in World War I to deliver messages. See those little tubes there would be attached to the pigeon's leg. And then a message could be placed inside one of those tubes. Just really remarkable, I think, that uh, World War I, they were still using birds to deliver messages for each other. Seems like we've come a long way. I don't think they use birds to deliver um, military commands anymore. These are squadron emblems of World War One, and these are a lot of fun. Um, you know, you see, see the military tends to be maybe a little bit stuffy. You know, it does not leave a lot of room for creation, but it just seems like they did give a little bit of freedom to the, uh, to the soldiers to de develop their own squadron symbols, and uh, it's good to see some creativity <laughs> and uh, free expression in the military, and some of these are just amazing. Um, yeah, there's like the devil, riding a bomb. There is a, a witch who is flying on a broom that is also a aircraft. Yeah, it looks like they used a lot of devils in their uh, in their imagery there. I like this place Oh, who's this guy here? No, it's not a new place. Here is a 1914 Italian military plane. And again, making it making them out of wood. Just there's a lot of inherent danger. I guess wood's very light, so I guess that would encourage people to make flying crafts out of wood. See this guy here doing a little bit of work on the front of the plane. This would make me very nervous if I had my hands in the front here with this big giant propeller. I would definitely be like, hey guys, you know, while I'm sticking my hand in here, please try not to try not to bump anything. Try not to accidentally turn anything on. As a matter of fact, could you guys maybe just get out of the cockpit while I'm working on this? Oh, this is an auto gyro. I guess it's like a cross between an airplane and a helicopter. Now that there is a seriously stylish plane. Now I have heard before that uh, this is one of the most dangerous jobs in all of like uh, military aircraft is being the guy in that bubble, shooting that gun. This is a display on flight training and how easily it, uh, it could go wrong. So yeah, you have young people learning how to fly these very expensive aircrafts. And apparently, uh, 
every once in a while one ends up nose down in the sand. These guys trying to dig the plane out here while the uh, pilot gets a tongue lashing from his superior there. He's like, but I tried to fly the plane good. I'm still learning. And he's like, oh, you knucklehead. See this plane getting all fueled up there. And there's someone just relaxing there, back behind the plane, with their dog. <laughs> and we passed through here, there's actually a very somber exhibit on uh, the Holocaust. So this accordion belonged to Gertrude Wolf here, who was a uh, Jewish child during, uh, during World War II. It says that her family fled to uh, to England to escape the uh, the Nazis and apparently they were allowing children refuge but uh, actually took her father and interned him so yes yeah, so a lot of countries not uh, receptive at the time this was 1938 so um, even countries like uh, England were not necessarily uh, giving refuge to the Jewish people it says that she uh, kept this uh, accordion through all her ordeal. It was her prized possession. And this is pretty chilling here. This is an actual concentration camp uniform on display here. This uh, belonged to uh, to Moritz Baumstein. And you can actually see a photo of him wearing the uniform right there. That is, oh, that is unsettling. On a less somber note, there is these awesome uh, flight jackets. Again, they would personalize them with unique imagery. And uh, that one says, King of the Heavies, Flying Circus. And then, oh my gosh, why? Why here in the National Museum of the American Air Force? Why? Is there a Cupid jacket? Cupid. <laughs> Heading into the World War II section here. Again, some uh, guys here getting their getting their plane ready for World War II. It's gonna be a long one, boys. There's a World War II era United States Army Air Force uniform. Over here, you've got a flight trainer. Looks like one of those uh, kitty rides outside of the uh, outside of the grocery store. This actually helps train the uh, the pilots for intense air battles. I do honestly think it's a lot of fun when they uh, paint the big scary mouth and eyeballs on the uh, on the aircraft. Makes me wonder what's this guy here? He's pointing pointing down at this guy here. Makes me wonder what he's saying. Is he like, hey? Get in here, or the plane's ready. The plane's, plane's getting ready to take off. Get in here. Yeah, apparently these uh, these plane names could get could get a little colorful at times. Here is Charles Alfred Chief Anderson. He was the first African American to earn a commercial pilot license, and was one of the crucial trainers for the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Apparently this is a very well-known aircraft, although I don't believe I've heard of it before. This is the Memphis Bell. It was the first heavy bomber to return to the U.S. Uh, after uh, flying over, uh, flew, flew over Europe 25 times. Oh, look at this one here. Look how many, uh, look how many this one has dropped. Yeah, see all crammed into the cockpit there. This guy here giving his uh, plane a new paint job. Got some paint there on your face, buddy. Yeah, this is pretty haunting. This box car here. It's a German box car used to transport uh, prisoners of war. It says that this particular box car used to transport American uh, American prisoners of war it was donated the French actually donated this uh, knowing its history these items are all items belong to prisoners of war American prisoners of war in Germany 
said that they made a clock out of cardboard that could actually keep time, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, little carvings and things done to pass the time. And uh, look at this down here. This is a apparently a homemade 12-way mouse trap made out of cans. The POWs were so bored they built this uh, elaborate functioning mouse trap. Here are the uniforms of different air forces from around the world. This is the Mexican Air Force, the Japanese Imperial Navy, there are the, uh, the Italians, and boo to these guys. You know who they are. Here's the uh, Brazilian Air Force showing off their awesome custom logo there. The Royal British Air Force. Looks like they're exchanging some souvenirs there. And finally, the uh, the United States. different motion simulator rides over here. Oh, looks like they're blasting off. Some more high tech planes in here. This is the Boeing Bird of Prey. This is a top secret, uh, top secret aircraft that operated during the 90s. A section on the Air Force during the uh, Korean War. And I guess we can actually head inside this uh, massive aircraft here. So let's uh, head inside here. Okay, so it's be like a plane where there'd be like a bunch of, bunch of uh, servicemen here strapped in probably getting ready to uh, do some parachuting out the window. Oh, so I guess they'd be, uh, they all come here when they're ready and jump out, jump out this back end. Just imagine leaping out of here. This is the four queens here. Again, I love the, love the color out here. Love the design, love the logo. Oh, this one's pretty interesting. This is a lifeboat. They actually drop from an airplane, so it has like a tail so it can cruise through the air, but once it lands in the ocean or a body of water, it turns into a lifeboat. There's the B-29 bomber with the, uh, the two of the seven dwarves on, uh, on the side there. It said that uh, because it had such a large fuselage, that it is uh, encouraged a lot of artwork here on the B-29. Look, there's the schmoo, the schmoo from Little Abner. All right, we can go through the uh, B-29, but we gotta watch our head. It's got very, very low ceilings. Here, if we can get in here without, uh, without crushing my head. Oh, yeah, it's a little, it's a little tight in here. Probably even harder to, you know, fight a war while in here. Much harder than just walking through it in a museum. Okay, so the crew would have to crawl through this tunnel here, which is really terrifying. And then down here is uh, where the bombs are. I wasn't recording, but I totally just, totally just smashed my head on this. I felt it like go down by my spinal cord. I didn't listen to the sign. That's where you go wrong when you quit listening to signs. Yeah, I'm starting to feel like maybe I wouldn't make the best, uh, best soldier. Now there is something ominous about a, uh, 
a plane with no pilot. Yeah, these aircrafts here are from the Vietnam War. This is a communication intercept van. Look at all those dishes and satellites there up on top. Uh, look at him just plugging away on his typewriter, intercepting messages. Yeah, some very stunning tableaus here in this museum. Oh look, it's Steve Canyon. It's a uh, comic book character, a military comic book character. I only know who he is because there is a random statue of him, the comic book character, in Idaho Springs, Colorado. This plane is named Patches, and it's gotten 567 hits. Yeehaw! It's that rescue helicopter up there pulling up someone to safety. These are the Thunder Buzzards. Apparently they rode motorcycles and uh, welcomed in returning planes that, uh, that had come back from battle. Here is the Thunder Buzzards uh, jacket there. See him showing off the Thunder Buzzard on the back. Let's see. Yeah, you'd think that uh, Air Force would be all about just being in the sky, but there is an Air Force uh, tank there. Okay, looks like we got the all clear. It's a POW section that shows the condition that uh, some U.S. soldiers were kept in in uh, Vietnam. As we head to the next hangar, there is a exhibit here about the recovery of the city of Berlin after the bombings of World War II. See some children here climbing trees to recover some of the airdrop supplies. Here's Vittles, the flying dog. Apparently this, uh, this dog accompanied its owner on many airdrops in Berlin dropping supplies, but she designed a special dog parachute in case the dog ever had to jump out of the plane. Fortunately, he actually never had to uh, make the dive. And here we have some Cold War era aircrafts. For our uh, Oppenheimer fans out there, we have a section on developing the bomb. And this is pretty crazy, the wreckage of this plane here. This plane was actually used to test nuclear explosions on. They would actually bomb near this plane to see how it would affect parked aircraft, which actually makes me a little nervous about how close I'm standing to it. This exhibit explains the figurative game of chess played by the United States and the uh, Soviet Union during the Cold War. This is a fun story. This is Iron Mike, the suit of armor. He was uh, the mascot of the 317th Fighter Interception Squadron in Alaska, but apparently different squads would kidnap him and take him to far reaches around the world. They'd throw him on a plane and he would wind up at other random bases. See, he was, he was originally in Alaska, but he would pop up in such faraway places as South Korea and uh, Greenland and uh, apparently they would constantly, the, the, the squad from Alaska would constantly be flying around the world trying to uh, retrieve Iron Bike. Let's see some uh, artwork here on this section of the Berlin Wall. You can see a guy over there has crawled to the top of the Berlin Wall seeking freedom, trying to escape East Berlin, and uh, he has left behind his Trabant, the Soviet era car known to be one of the worst cars to have ever existed. It looks like we can actually climb in this cockpit here, or at least attempt. I don't know if it necessarily will fit, but I uh, will plunge myself into this cockpit here. All right, let's see if we can just, just drop down in here. Okay. I don't want to 
want to hit my head again. Okay, there we go. And there we are in the cockpit. Oh my gosh, look at all these controls. This looks uh, perplexing. Yeah, can you even imagine knowing that all these dials, all these buttons do? You just like, psh, 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 psh. you have to pay attention to all this. You got to know what's going on. You got to know your surroundings. You got to know what levers to flip, what buttons to toggle. Yeah, you better know what you're doing once you get in here. Imagine, imagine if you just like started flying one of these and you didn't know what any of this did. Yet somehow you got in the air and you were like, man, I really should have, really should have figured out what all these did before I got up here because now I don't even, don't even know how to land. I don't even know if that's what that does. That that probably has probably doesn't make that noise or or shoot anything. Another cool shark mouth plane there. This one's called the Iraqi Scud Seeker. This is the Nighthawk here. Used primarily in the 80s. Was a uh, difficult to detect aircraft. That uh, it is wild looking. This helicopter has a mustache. So that gives me an estimated distances on, on what our risk is if we have these bombs come close to us. And uh, toss that foot down. I gave them a clear hot. This is Sergeant Ramon Colon Lopez, who uh, traveled to Afghanistan right after 9-11, served as a, a personal protector to the uh, newly elected president of Afghanistan he said that uh, everywhere he went he carried a Cheshire cat which had uh, great significance to him. There's a bomb robot retrieving this shell here. I still feel like this guy right here is too close. He's like not wearing very much protective gear. This guy's got enough gear but still probably a little too close honestly. Our are open area. Clear forward right side bump. Clear forward and left go. Clear ground. In addition to lodging, the train facilities are convenient to living areas. The massive B2 spirit there. It's crazy. Here's a place to practice your salute because you put your face in there and uh, see how your salute is. These are examples of cars that utilized Air Force ingenuity. You can see the Air Force logo on the car there. This is the Vapor Supercar here. This area here, full of space rockets. Wow. This is the Excelsior balloon gondola. It says this was tested in the 50s and 60s as a way to test parachutes jumping from very high uh, very high elevation. So this would be shot up with a balloon and then the uh, test pilot would jump out. Look at that, he's like wearing like all this gear because it's so cold, has like a, it's like a space helmet on to uh, test out his, if his parachute will work in space. See that right below his foot, it says, this is the highest step in the world. And here is a genuine, Flying Saucer. This is the Avro car. Um, so this was a genuine attempt. Originally it was uh, a company in Canada was trying to develop this, then later contracted with the US military to create this Flying Saucer, which literally could both drive on the ground and then it could lift off and fly, just like a Flying Saucer from a science fiction movie. See the bubbles there? Like where the the uh, crew would sit. I guess it would only seat uh, two people. One in each bubble there. 
And this thing actually worked, kind of. Um, you can see a picture of it there actually flying, actually hovering and soaring. But apparently it was, uh, it could only go 35 miles per hour and um, it was uh, very unstable. So kind of a non-success, but uh, yeah, I, I'm so excited. I get to see an actual real life flying saucer. You can see a section dedicated to spacecraft and astronauts here. We're gonna head into this replica space shuttle here. Okay, this is a hollow space shuttle here. You can actually look out onto uh, onto the floor here, out on, into the hangar. And there is their special exhibit over there on uh, mechanical dinosaurs. Okay, so this exhibit is called Dinosaurs in Motion. And it looks like there are these dinosaur skeletons made of metal that are actually, you can physically manipulate through like puppet strings to make them move. That's pretty interesting. Start out with our T-Rex here. I guess this is the T-Rex lever. So we pull the lever, pull the lever there. Okay, and we can make the T-Rex go rawr. Yeah, you can hear his, hear his mouth clanging there. So back here, okay, this is a crow. This isn't necessarily a dinosaur. We control the crow here. These are the motion controls. Turn on the crow. Oh, there he goes. Started moving when I hit that button. That is so, okay, that is really, really cool there. Wow. Okay. Oh, there's a second scene. Let's see what he does. That is crow scene, scene two there. We can actually change the lighting as well. Oh, give him that ominous, ominous red light. Let's turn him on again with the red light. Oh, spooky. Got our buddy the Triceratops here. Apparently he is spring-loaded. We can, yes, yes. Oh, wow. Here is Orna, Ornithomimus. We got two of them here. Let's see, we, we, we turn the motion up using this. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, move up and down to, to I wonder if you can make them fight. Arr, arr. Can you make them fight? Will they ever fight each other? <laughs> yeah, I think this is another spring-loaded, spring-loaded dino. Oh boy. Parasaurolophilus here. You have to uh, pull these strings. You got these strings. Manipulate what he does. A lever on this one. It's a plesiosaur there, and a uh, water dinosaur. And we got the uh, control panel here. We'll, we'll turn them up. Oh, you can turn them up to 11. Look at that. I may need to turn them down a little bit. Here is controlled by these wheels over here. And look at 
this here. This is unbelievable. This is the Air Force One plane that was in uh, service for generations. This carried the presidents from JFK all the way up to Clinton. And uh, apparently this is well known as the plane that uh, flew JFK to Berlin where he gave his Ich bin ein Berliner speech. And this is pretty amazing, but we can actually go inside. Apparently it's pretty narrow in there. There's this uh, grate here that shows you how narrow it is, but I think, I think we'll fit. We've been in tighter, tighter fits today. Into the cockpit there, Air Force One. But look at this, throughout this hallway, there's like different offices, control panels here. There is a uh, a kitchen here, with an oven, a stove, and uh, okay, some normal normal planes there. Oh yeah, there are some narrow corridors here. Okay, there's some more more luxurious seating in this area. The TV set. Oh yeah, look at this, like a conference room here in the air. It's like, a, oh yeah, another conference room back here. A lot of meetings probably took place. A lot of very important meetings took place aboard Air Force One here. Yeah, second, second kitchen here in the back. There's the, uh, there's the bathrooms. So they said here in the missile gallery, there's actually an elevator that will take you to the uh, second floor. Yeah, here from the second floor, you get kind of a different view of the hangars. Yeah, you can hear the, uh, hear the dinosaurs there in the back. Over here we have a small diner, but next to the diner we have uh, exhibit on space food. It's delicious food from space. Yeah, some, some freeze-dried bags here, a nice delicious packet of salmon salad there. Oh, I think I will, uh, I think I'll take the, the corn chowder, or maybe these sausage granules. And if all else fails, just suck some beef and gravy out of a tube. And while in the diner, you can actually dine while overlooking some of these aircraft over here. And I believe it is now time to exit through the gift shop. Yeah, they said, I, I, again, I've never heard of the Memphis Bell, but they actually sell t-shirts with the Memphis Bell logo on it. And look at this, you can actually buy some delicious MREs. Let's see here, oh, a little, little packet of peanut butter there. There's some crackers. Feels like there's a brick in there. So they sell some hot sauce served in grenades. Now I didn't see any info on UFOs or aliens in the museum, but the gift shop has an Area 51 section where you can buy some uh, alien salt and pepper shakers, an alien lava lamp, other various extraterrestrial items. So yeah, after you visit the museum, you can head out to your car, you can eat an MRE and have a dessert with a little bit of freeze-dried, freeze-dried astronaut ice cream. And 2024 is the year of the pressed penny here at the Carpetbagger channel and they have three three press penny machines, four designs each. Love to pick out some of my uh, favorite aircraft here. 
Uh, looks like they got the right flyer there. This is my camera bag here. I have my extra batteries. I have uh, quarters and pennies for uh, four pressed penny machines. Okay, so I got the right flyer as well as the B2 bomber there and uh, yeah I am I am quickly obtaining a almost unmanageable collection of press petties I've gotten so many on this trip I'm learning that they're actually just about everywhere and that was the National Museum of the American Air Force I should point out the museum is completely free just walk in there and see everything without spending a penny. Um, so I've been putting this off for a while. I've gotten a lot of recommendations over the years, people telling me, please, please, please check out the Air Force Museum in Dayton. Admittedly, like a lot of military museums are not my favorites. I've found some really great ones that I really enjoyed over the years, but I'm always a little trepidatious about military museums. But this is, I, I can appreciate, Regardless of the subject matter, I can appreciate when a museum is amazing, when it is well put together, and this is an amazing well put together museum. The sheer amount of planes and aircraft is absolutely overwhelming. There's just so much. If you are in to military planes, I this would be a literal heaven for, for anyone fascinated with military aircraft, the Air Force, uh, Air Force One, uh, space shuttles, uh, just everything you can imagine. And then that uh, the, the, the dinosaur exhibit, the uh, the kinetic dinosaur exhibit the, in the back was very unexpected. Did not expect that to find that here. It was a, a very interesting and unique exhibit. Uh, even though it didn't necessarily fit in with the uh, theme of the museum, it was pretty pretty amazing. So yeah, I would highly recommend this if, if you are interested in any of the subject matter here. This is an amazing museum and uh, probably, you know, I, I, I you know, you, you could have probably spent more than a day here. If you look at everything, read everything, really immerse yourself, this is probably a multi-day experience. This is probably just one of the largest museums I have literally ever been to. But uh, thank you guys for joining me here at the National Museum of the American Air Force. Um, if you like these videos, please subscribe. I travel around the country filming roadside attractions, amusement parks, museums, haunted houses, and other fun random stuff. If you'd like to support the channel, consider contributing to Patreon. $3 or more, get you a postcard once a month from me to you. Also selling enamel pins in the Etsy shop and doing personalized messages on Cameo. All the information for that is in the description of this video and all of that helps keep this train on the track, this boat in the water, and this fighter jet high in the air. Until next time, my friends, this one's in the bag.